Pastor, you're <laughs> Oh, we're being recorded. Okay. If we cannot be saved by the law, what is the purpose of the law? That's mm -hmm. one of the questions that we're asking and answering today in the Bible study, and I welcome you. I also welcome you to our worship at Trinity Lutheran Church, 8.30 and 10.30 services. The 8.30 is traditional, and the 10.30 is more contemporary as to the music and style of the worship. You know that by now, if you are worshiping at Trinity Lutheran, 400 North Swinton, the corner of Lake Ida and uh, Swinton. Let's begin this very brief introduction to Paul's letter to the Galatians. Again, it's not a verse by verse study, but only the main theme. And this is the main theme, the central thought. Paul's letter to the Galatians is the gospel with absolutely no requirements. No requirements that we do good in order to merit forgiveness or obtain salvation. That was the issue before Paul when he discovered what was happening in a church that he had founded some years before he wrote this letter. All right. So let's talk about tradition. Uh, the, fiddler, the Fiddler on the Roof musical and movie. Uh, <laughs> you could tell how much the the Jewish people celebrated tradition. And I want to tell you what tradition means in the Bible. Tradition means something that has been handed down from the previous gener generation or generations uh, to the present generation. And you can name many traditions, some of them religious and some of them are not. We always do this on and then fill in the blank for a holiday. That's mm -hmm. a tradition. Uh, there are traditions in the church, and we could name, oh, dozens and dozens of them over the period of the centuries. Well, we're not going to do that in detail, but we're going to apply the word tradition as it was used in the letter of St. Paul to the Galatians. But I'm going to pause before we get into that and ask about our traditions. You know about our traditions. They can be good and they can keep order and regulate our worship life. And they do, right? And those of us who attend the 830 service, a traditional, you get the word? Okay. <laughs> it's called foundations, but it is a rather traditional worship service. There are many traditional worship services beside the one that we use. Worship traditions also can be a problem. They get in the way sometimes. Uh, they can be a problem, especially if they command what God has not commanded. And I don't think anybody in our congregation is ever doing that. Because either because we've studied the history of liturgy or just a rather intuitive feeling about it, I think we all realize that our liturgical practice was not handed down by God. It is a human tradition. However, you and I also know that our traditional worship services are filled with quotes from the Holy Bible. That is not tradition, that is truth. And what over the centuries has been done is that those who organize and conduct the worship services have taken what was there and changed it to include more and more scripture. For example, I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. That's what the pastor says. And the people say, and you forgave the iniquity of our sin. That's a quote from Psalm 32, as you know. So we can keep on doing that. And I encourage you when you have time 
now that the I believe the hymn books will soon be returned to the pew racks. Mm -hmm. If you have time, if you page through the liturgical services in the front, you will see all the quotations from the Bible with a parenthesis as to where the quote is coming from. And you see that our worship service is God pleasing because it is based on his word. So we have this contrast between traditions that are good and some that could become a problem. So would you uh, would you talk about um, Evelyn, Chris, and Dee? Mm -hmm. Talk about the worship traditions in the Lutheran Church. How are they good, and how could they become a problem for some? This is your turn. Oh, gosh, what do we have? What are the traditions in our worship service? Can you name some? We usually follow uh, the divine service, which is written out at the beginning of the hymnal. So right. I think that's a tradition uh, there. How about the contents of that? Well, it stays the same. OK. And what's the, what is the value in it staying uh, approximately the same? It's a tradition. <laughs> what's the value of it, of that? Passing it on. I'm sorry, I didn't understand what you said. <clears throat> Not forgetting it, passing it on. That's just all I said. Uh, would you say that in different words uh, so I can understand? um uh, continuing it for the next generation passing it on i mean they didn't stop it although i think the late service doesn't do that that's that's correct uh the late service does not have a form that stays the same every week <laughs> you know if you study the history of liturgical worship you can study it back into the way the jews conducted their worship mm -hmm. now there's some obvious things that are biblical. The benediction is from number 626. There, God tells Moses to tell Aaron, he will put my name upon the people. And the name that is put upon the people is the triune name, which is in Matthew 28, 20. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, is the name that the pastor puts upon the people at the beginning of the worship. So you see that the worship begins and ends with the Trinity. That's mm -hmm. more important than you realize because the Trinitarian Father, Son, Holy Spirit, which is taught in the scriptures, has been, over the centuries, there's been times when one or more of those persons have been just left out or one of the persons has been emphasized at the expense of the others. Hmm. So uh, don't take the Trinity for granted, please. Hmm. Now talk about the, uh, the confession and absolution. I already mentioned from Psalm 32, that's a tradition that we use the confession and absolution. Uh, we don't have to. The creed is a tradition. We have three creeds. We use one in particular because it is common to all Christians. You understand? It unites us with them when we are saying the same thing. Julius mentioned that last week. So these are some of the traditions. And why are they good is really my question. I think you just uh, said that it, it unites us. Okay, there is a unity. You can mm -hmm. go anywhere in the world, a pastor said at the meeting last Tuesday. Yeah. You can go anywhere in the world, and even if the language is different, you know that they are saying the same thing because the liturgical elements are the same. Right. I'm talking about Lutheran worship, of course. <laughs> now, those who are of another denomination might or might not have that same advantage. Okay. 
So there's something good because they tell what the scriptures say and rehearse so that our memory is refreshed every week. Well, why, how, go ahead. It passes it on to the next uh, group of people. I don't want to say generation because it could be old people that are coming in, passes it on to them. That's very important. Yeah. And that's what the scriptures tell us to do so that a coming generation will know the works of the Lord in Psalm 78. Now, how could these liturgical practices uh, become a problem for some? I heard someone um, that goes to the second service say that um, it's too long. Um, this, the, the, the worship um, is just too long. And, and some of the responses that we uh, sing are, are too long. Um, I guess they just don't want to sit that long. Um, that's, yeah, that was one objection. I, I, I have a comment, um, and I'm sorry about that other uh, comment, but I think it should be mixed up a little bit because it's almost said in a rote manner that you don't think people are thinking about it. That's just my comment. Well, I've heard that too. Yeah. <laughs> but in a way, that's a good, a good thing, I think. Henry. Other problems that you can think of? In answer to the doing it by rote. They think that we pray too much, I think, in, in first service. Really? They want they want to sing more and okay. praise, singing with praise actually. So that's a good thing. Maybe it's just that some people don't care about tradition. Um, I feel very comfortable with the tradition. Mm -hmm. So that's why I go to that service and I enjoy every part of it. In fact, I wish we did more. We've left out some of the old traditions. We leave out some of the divine service, but- um, Really? Mm. Well, you'll find that most of the traditional services are the older Lutherans too. I mean, it seems like the younger people are going more for the other service. Oh, that's true. You might be surprised to learn that church bodies that used to be non-liturgical are mm -hmm. rediscovering what they've never had in bringing liturgical elements into their worship services that used to be free form. I, I, believe. I say free form rather than contemporary because it, okay. in some congregations they did not introduce contemporary uh, music songs but continued with the old line hymns that they've been, their great grandma sang, uh, but they have put in liturgical elements because they saw the value of them for the people. The value is in the rehearsal. If that becomes rote, the answer is, think about what you are singing and saying. Think uh, about your confession. I, for one, uh, think that the pastor ought to leave more room when he when there it says a silence for personal confession. Well, we don't have all day, but I can sometimes think of several things at that point that I would like to confess to my Lord in my heart. And the answer to my objection is, well, couldn't you do that at home before? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I didn't think of it this morning. Uh, it It is a rehearsal of my own sin that I need to, to do before. Mm. 
because they bother me and I needed to learn again that Christ died for those two. Well, well this I, was, go ahead. I find that I have to do that before service. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's why I get there a little earlier. I may like I, that. Uh, may I comment on music again? Yes. Um, I, I, I like both services. I mean, that's, that's just put it both ways. But um, with the music in the second service, I find it interesting to see what current day people are making into songs. Now, I love the songs. I seldom like the way they are presented by the singers. I think uh, um, one was too loud. One, I think, is too sexy and, and just all things like that. But um, the, the words are what the, the newer day people are putting in God's name. And I think that's pretty wonderful. It's not the same songs all the time, which is the traditional service pretty much does the same. Well, maybe not. I mean, it's not. But I mean, you know, um, you do get the current people, just like some of these radio programs. I think one is called love something i'm not sure i can't think of it now it won't come to me but um they're the they're what the current people are writing and and they're fantastic really they're very good that's the end of my syllogy <laughs> okay that's fine I, I appreciate your comments and to some extent without using your names or anything like that whenever we talk about this in elders meeting i can pass on the generalities of, of what you've been saying. Um, you know, I cleanse them. Okay. All right. <laughs> uh, you know, I uh, don't want anyone to be hurt. Now, there was a time in that Jesus had to say something about traditions that had nothing to do with the word of God. Uh, which of you would like to read Mark 7, 5 to 8? Well, I'll start and you go the route. Is that okay? Okay. Um, let me see. Mark 7, 5 to 8. And the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, why do you why do your disciplines not walk according to oh, disciples? I'm sorry. Why do your disciples walk do not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? And he said to them, well, did Isaiah prophecy, Isaiah prophecy of you hypocrites, as it is written, quotes, this people honors me with their lips, but their hearts is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. You leave the commandments of God and you hold to the tradition of men. You see the word tradition in there? Okay. Now, when I was uh, young, I had a Jewish friend, and uh, when I went to his house after school at his invitation to have cookies and milk, <laughs> um, he insisted that we go wash our hands first. And I thought, why? I don't do that at home. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I should have been washing at home for sanitation reasons, but the tradition held that any time they ate, they had to go wash their hands. Okay, I wanted the cookie, so I. <laughs> so Isaiah talked about these hypocrites 800 years before, but their heart is far from me is a is a declaration a condemnation that there was no faith they're just going through the motions doing what was commanded and they were introducing things that were not commanded by god and they weren't doing the commandments that god had commanded so you see how tradition got in the way of true religion and that's a problem. 
Jesus accused the Pharisees, you leave the commandments of God and hold to the tradition of men. You're off track here. Hmm. Worse than that, the tradition had invaded the lives of all the Jewish people, laying down another 613 laws to the, those of the Old Testament. Now, I've looked up to see where that 613 came from. And there is a tradition that when Moses went up to get the commandments and issue them to the people of Israel, he had, he had another conversation with God that wasn't recorded. And then when he came down, he gave these 613. But there's no evidence that that ever happened. In order to support the 613 laws, they had to make up something to, to prove it. So they made up a tradition <laughs> to support their traditions. Oh, my God. <laughs> well, uh, not many of the Jewish people live according to those 613. And, and as you study the 613, you can boil them down to 11, according to one of uh, the Psalms that David wrote. And then you can take those 11 and boil them down to just three if you look at what uh, one of the minor prophets said in his prophecy. And then you can boil them down to two, which Moses said, the love God and love your neighbor as yourself. Right. <laughs> Do you understand how all of them can be summarized in that word love? And that's what Jesus did in the, old, in the New Testament because everything we do in obedience to God is based on our love for him and our love for our neighbor. So we don't need 613. And the 10, as they are amplified and explained and applied in the New Testament many times, those 10 are, are not the only commandments. They are commandments in the New Testament which are based on them. And they are applied to our lives by the apostles and, of course, by Jesus. Right. All right. So we still have laws. And we're going to talk about the laws that we do have in a little bit. The Judaizers that I spoke about a couple times ago, these are the people insisting on the tradition because the Gentiles were coming into the church and the Judaizers were all upset because they weren't keeping the laws of Moses, meaning the traditions. Okay. In, in particular, they were insisting that for a Gentile to come into the church, which was their church, the Jewish church. Well, they were mistaken. They were insisting that a Gentile be circumcised. And um, that wasn't going to happen. But that's what they were insisting. And they were spoiling the church at, uh, in the Galatian territory. You can see how that would have been a great upset. And some of the people, I don't know, would, uh, would not have come in. And that was uh, a hindrance to the Great Commission. So tradition is one thing. God's law is quite another. You have to be able to separate the two. If you're doing something out of tradition, that's fine. You have the freedom to do that, but you cannot insist that someone else do it. Now, let's take a simple example that is not religious, all right? Like hand washing? <laughs> well, uh, that's, that's one of them. But um, I know a family where the tradition is you take off your shoes as soon as you come into the house and they they sit there by the door. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You don't walk around the house in your shoes because after all they've they've been all over the world and they've tracked in all kinds of things and and in the days when our carpets were <laughs> were more threadbare that was important. It wasn't much else on the floor. Uh well that was a tradition and I really didn't want that in my house so we never did it. <laughs> Unless they were muddy, you know, snow and mud. So that's a tradition. And I cannot insist that you follow my tradition. 
when you come to my house for dinner, <laughs> uh, <laughs> you will find the spoon on the left and the fork uh, and the knife and the, you'll find the fork on the left and the knife and the spoon on the right. That's a tradition my mother taught me. I'll bet <laughs> you do the same thing. <laughs> right. But, you know, when family comes over, sometimes they're just there. <laughs> Someplace. Uh, I try to set it up neatly. And I even like to fold the napkin. You see, we're getting into tradition that mean, that mean nothing and yeah. nothing to do with God's law. Tradition in the church ought to be recognized for what it is. And then we ought to know what part of our tradition is based on God's word. All right. I don't want to belabor that too much. So here's my question. How many are guilty of uh, on the basis of God's law, not on the basis of tradition? How many are guilty? No one. We all are. Okay. Yeah. Yes. And yet God, you, you know, I'm, I'm going to turn the corner now and smile because God in his infinite and purposeful mercy sent his son into the world. Right. He did that out of his choice and our great need. Yeah. And that son gave himself for our sins. The word gave being a very small word to represent that tremendous sacrifice that we sing about in some of our hymns. Right. Our hymns confess what we believe and our hymns celebrate those things. And our hymns serve to pass the truth of scripture from one generation to the next. That's a value that's based on scripture. Now let me repeat what St. Paul writes in Galatians chapter one, the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself. Ah, oh, would you describe that giving? Oh. You're referring to when he went to the cross, especially right? that. Who gave himself. Sacrifice. He sacrificed. Sacrifice. That doesn't mean, I mean, there's a lot of content behind the word sacrifice. Yes, but he sacrificed his very life. Yeah. Did he have to? Well, he had to. Did he have to do that? Yes. Trick question. <laughs> yeah. Because, because his father... Uh, sent him to do that right so he had to it was it a is. divine necessity but it was also voluntary yeah and that makes the gift ever so more valuable mm -hmm. for our sins the lord jesus christ who gave himself for our sins <clears throat> Look at the word hour in big print and underlined. Mm -hmm. I want you to, to realize the import of that little word for mm -hmm. our sins. Now I have some quotes, delicious, meaningful quotes mm -hmm. uh, okay. from Martin Luther. He is writing these words at the beginning of the Galatian commentary. And he is writing on the basis of the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins. He's just looking at that phrase, who gave himself for our sins. And he writes many words just on that phrase. For example, Martin Luther says, he, that is St. Paul, does not say who received our works, but who gave. Gave what? Not gold or silver or paschal lambs or an angel, but himself. What for? not for a crown or kingdom or our goodness, but for our sins. These words are like so many thunderclaps of protest from heaven against every kind and type of self-merit. Underscore these words, for they are full of comfort for sore consciences. 
let Martin Luther go on. So vicious is sin that only the sacrifice of Christ could atone for our sin. When we reflect that the one little word sin embraces the whole kingdom of Satan and that it includes everything that is horrible, we have reason to tremble, but we are careless. We make light of sin. We think that by some little work or merit, we can dismiss sin. The genius of Christianity takes the words of Paul who gave himself for our sins as true and efficacious. We are not to look upon our sins as insignificant trifles. On the other hand, we are not to regard them as so terrible that we must despair. Learn to believe that Christ was given not for picayune and imaginary transgressions, but for mountainous sins. Not for one or two, but for all. Not for sins that can be discarded, but for sins that are stubbornly ingrained. Practice this knowledge and fortify yourself against despair, particularly in the last hour when the memory of past sins assails the conscience. Say with confidence, Christ, the Son of God, who was given not for the righteous but for sinners, if I had no sin, I should not need Christ, because my transgressions are multiplied and my own efforts at self-justification rather a hindrance than a furtherance. Therefore, Christ, the Son of God, gave himself into death for my sins. To believe this is to have eternal life. Wow. Wow. Those are powerful words. You can download the entire 1535 commentary that Luther wrote um, online. You just look, you know, put, put your search engine, say Martin Luther commentary on the epistle to the Galatians. And it was translated by Theodore Grebner in, uh, in, the, in the 1920s. <laughs> he, he took the German and the Latin and he put it into English so that you and I could understand it and read it. Dr. Grebner was a, a great servant of the church, a professor at our St. Louis Seminary at the time. I want to talk about Grebner. Uh, I want to talk about what Luther said here. What do you say? Okay. You have questions about what Martin Luther said? Comments? Where, where is, um, uh, you said this commentary is on the epistle of Galatians. It's, it's, I'm looking, um, I'm looking at my book of uh, Galatians and Luther on Galatians and it's not, it's not the same. So uh, this comes, this is in a different place. Where can I find this? Well, you just put Luther commentary on the epistle to the Galatians, 1535, oh. Grebner, put that in your search engine. And I, there's one other thing you can put in there, and I'm trying to think what it was. Can't bring it up in my memory. Um, I have the Lutheran Study Bible. No, this is not from the Lutheran Study Bible. This oh. is uh, this is online, and there are over 250 pages of it. Oh. It's really long. It's verse by verse. It's what I'm not doing. <laughs> yeah. And I think you'll, you'll find it, uh, maybe you'll find it more than you want. But there's some beautiful quotes in there, and you can just kind of run through it and see what your eyes rest upon. But Luther was a powerful teacher, and he lectured. And uh, there were a couple of people who took down notes. And then they transcribed those notes, and uh, that became the commentary. Yeah. But he did this three different times. 
You know, um, with um, with the word rather a uh, or F, my own efforts to self justification rather than a hindrance. It brought to mind um, the self justification in the in the old uh, pictures, painted pictures. Uh, I. I I can't think of, he translated the Bible, but I forgot it, you know, where they took the whips and whipped themselves. Uh, well, there uh, were times that they punished themselves, uh, the monks did, for their sin. Yeah. Uh, they right. thought that that would merit forgiveness, but of course, that was a horrible thing to do. Yes, yes. So there were... Um, They meant well, but they didn't get the word, I guess. Yeah, like uh, going up the steps of the Vatican on your knees. Mm. I couldn't take that. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it was thought that the more pain there was, the better, uh, the more, more it would good. You would, you would merit. This was terrible doctrine. And to the to some extent, the Roman Church has been reformed since then. So, if you're interested, uh, go and do some more reading. Um, after a while, your eyes will glaze over, and you need to put it to rest and come back another time. It's yeah. heavy reading, but it's it's delicious to the soul. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here's a question for you. If we cannot be saved by the law, what is the purpose of the law? Mm -hmm. Well, the law is made to keep order. All right, it, good. It's not made for non-sinners. It, it's made for the people that don't follow. That's right. That's the first uh, purpose of the law. Sometimes we call it a curb, C-U-R-B, curb. And uh, well, what's uh, are there other purposes of the law? It shows us our sin. Yeah, that's the mirror, the second purpose. And the third purpose, while you're at it, you're on a roll. Yeah. Uh, let's see, what do, we, what do we have? Do we have mirror? Yes. And it also is a guide for our life. Oh, no. okay, thank you. I, uh, I'm going to put this sentence in here. I don't have a slide for it. We are saved through faith alone. You agree with that, don't you? Yes. We are saved through faith alone. But, say, but faith is never alone. It is impossible for a person to be a believer and then do nothing at all that is good. Yeah. It's like a tree, it must bear fruit. Mm -hmm. Or like a vine. I am the vine, you are the branches. You're going to bear much fruit. Yeah. So the purpose of the law is manifold. And we, we are glad that God gave us the law. Paul says in Romans, I, I must say that the law is good. The law reveals our fallen nature. We are sold under sin, says Paul in Romans 7, 14. Oh, yeah. And it reveals our need for a savior. Without the law, we might think, who needs the gospel? From what do I need saved? Mm -hmm. So read what Paul says in Galatians 3, 24. Uh, who didn't read? Okay. Go ahead, Dee. Galatians 3.24. Yes. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. This word guardian is the word uh, for a person who yeah. is employed by the family way back then. And that person make sure that the child does his homework and recites his memory and then uh, he passes. He makes sure that he gets to school on time and things like that. 
a guardian was appointed to make sure that that would happen. I bet a lot of parents would like to have that person today. <laughs> they would have to be paid quite well in order to do that. Right. But it was expected in that society. So Paul uses that analogy that the law was our guardian to show us that we needed Christ to come for us mm. so that we might be justified by faith, by faith. You look up the word by faith, and see how many times it is in the Bible. Here's a question. What would you say if we remove the law altogether, banishing good works as potentially harmful to our salvation? Well, yes, it's potentially harmful because if we get busy doing good works, we might begin to think that we are saved by those works. Yeah. Good. So let, let's just get rid of the law altogether. No. No? Well, you, it, it, you said previously it guides your life, too. That yes. Was well, I, I don't need that, right? I have, I'm saved. Oh. <laughs> Uh, here's another sentence, uh, the, uh, a quote from way back. I can't tell you um, the idea of, of, of works uh, sometimes uh, getting in the way. Here's what it is. Love God and do what you want. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> now, wait a minute. <laughs> Before you object too mightily, love God and do what you want. If you love God, you'll want to do what he wants. Yes. Really? Sometimes we stray. <laughs> yes. And go back to loving God. If I love God, I'll ask him, Lord, what would you have me to do? Mm -hmm. And he would say, read my word. You'll find there what you are to do. What am I to do? Well, uh, pray and ask God for guidance and you will receive it. Believe that you have received it. This is the way we walk as people of faith, as men and women who love God, and we don't want to get rid of the law. Well, what would you say to a Christian who asserted that there are no rules, there are no laws for believers to follow? Has anybody ever said that or anything like that to you? If he's a Christian, how could he say there's no law? <laughs> that person has not been well taught. No. <laughs> he doesn't know the Old Testament for sure. And there are rules and laws in the New Testament for us to follow as well. So I would say, well, you haven't read the word. And that uh, in the problem. What about the problems? I mean that they haven't they haven't read the Bible. Right. Or been taught the Bible. I don't say you have to read it and be taught uh, correctly. Well, I remember there was a preacher on TV, maybe he's still there, that says that we I think he died and his son took over. I'm not going to tell you who or where, but he said, I don't preach any law in my sermons because people are feeling bad enough and I don't want them to go home feeling uh, worse. So mm -hmm. I don't tell, I don't preach the law. Apparently he didn't know it either. Yeah. So if someone said this, uh, do you know what this is called? Blasphemy? Yeah, it is that. But what is it? What is the name for someone who is against the teaching of the law? False teacher. That'd be a oh. false teacher, right? There's a word for it, and it may be a new word to you, or you didn't realize this word was hanging around here. It's not in the Bible in so many words, but it is described. Oh, is that legalism? Oh, we had that, and it's no. That's when people insist on the on the law as a means to be saved. Okay. He's, a, he's a heretic if he goes against the church. Right. Heresy. This word is antinomianism. Antinomianism. Oh Have you heard that word before? 
<laughs> I can't even read it. <laughs> Antinomianism. I got to write that down. All right, we're going to break it down. I was taught in uh, my early grades to open up the dictionary and look at the etymology. Weren't you taught that? Yeah. Yeah, those things in parentheses. No, you skip right over to the definition. But look at the look at the where it comes from. Anti, you know, it is against, don't you? Right? Words with anti are against. And gnome, you would probably not know, is Latin for the law. So antinome is against the law, against the keeping of the law. So people who are against having rules for believers to follow are antinomians. Mm. Now, you won't be asked that when you uh, get to the gate of heaven. <laughs> That's an old joke. Are you talking about any law or, or the, the law in the Christian context? That doesn't mean they will speed just because they can, although that might be also true, but it means they are against having the law in the church to be taught, like that preacher I talked about. Yeah. He was an antinomian. Okay, and this comes up in a subtle way sometimes. Galatians 5.13, uh, who hasn't read yet? Okay. Go ahead. For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Now that says a lot. In Galatians 5.1, uh, Paul says stand fast in the freedom wherewith Christ has made you free. And he means free from the domination of these man-made laws. Right? That's your freedom. Mm -hmm. But you were never freed from, <laughs> from God's law. That couldn't be. Mm. When, when you were saved by the gospel, that didn't mean well, now I don't have to think about God's commands anymore. Yeah. You were called to freedom. Oh, don't use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. That means as an opportunity to sin. I can do what I want. <laughs> you see, you're misreading your freedom. Now you're free to serve. Does that sound like a contradiction? I'm a Christian. And I am free to serve God and anyone else that I come into contact with where I have the means and the will to do it. So I have a lot to do in this life. I always have a lot to do. There's always more to do than I have time or ability or strength. <laughs> and you and I are in the same boat together because we're a little bit older than we used to be, but we still have the freedom to serve one another. That's what love does. Love seeks opportunities to do something for God and for the person we love. It can mm -hmm. be a small thing, like a phone call in the afternoon, how are you doing? It can be a great thing, like going to the sick bed of someone day after day after day, and maybe some of you have done that, because it just had to be done. Oh, Can you think of times when you used your freedom to love? Mm. You want to share any of those? Mm. You'll feel like you're bragging about it, and you don't want to do that. I understand. And uh, we don't have to publish it in the newspaper every time we do something good. <laughs> that's, that's one of my sins. <laughs> I uh, am one of those men who's afraid that I'm not going to get <laughs> noticed for. And I was about to tell you what I did this week for Janie while she was over at the sick bed of my our son's mother in law. Oh. She has spent hours and hours uh, there. 
it's both boring and challenging but she would not want me to broadcast her love she could have said no Okay. how grateful i am that i have such a wife as Jeannie, and i i can't go on because that would be against the law to broadcast her good works i'm just giving you an example and i wasn't jealous i wasn't say hey what about me right <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's been pretty quiet in our house this week. <laughs> 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 oh, yeah. Okay. Now, in the time remaining, I have a few excerpts from the letter to the Galatians. And I'm going to move through these pretty fast. Okay. And to rest my voice, why do I need to rest my voice? Uh, to involve you. To read, uh, starting. Some of them are long. And some are short. Evelyn, would you start? Okay. Yes. Now so we're in chapter I, one, so this is Galatians oh, 1 11. 1 11. Okay. For I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. I did not immediately consult with anyone. His source was God himself. Mm -hmm. He in some way met with the risen Jesus Christ and he doesn't tell us where or how or when. Chris, would you read this? Yes, chapter 2, verse 19. For though the law, I died to the law, or through the law, I died to the law, so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for, it's, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. And we've mentioned that before, yeah. haven't we? Right. Yeah. If righteousness were through the law, yeah. then this, go ahead. I, I, 21 on, it, is it confusing? I do not nullify the grace of God. He doesn't nullify it by going against it. He doesn't make it to no effect. The grace of God is operative uh, whether we believe it or not. But when the grace of God was operative, working in his life, he knew and he believed that it was by faith. Yes, exactly. Got it. If I have to add my works to Christ's death, well, how come his death wasn't enough? Yeah. That's my only saving grace, because I don't think I do enough good works. Well, uh, press on. Press on. Exactly. Press on. And the more you involve yourself in the, in the life of others, the more you will see the need and it's the time when you say, oh, I don't really want to do that. Yeah. <laughs> I know it in my own life. Yep. Yeah. And, but you do it anyway. And, and do it anyway. Mm -hmm. Remember how I defined uh, the idea of uh, self-discipline? Is every day do something that you don't really want to do. Mm -hmm. And you, you push past. You push past that, that barrier. Right. I don't want to bring up personal examples. I just know there are times when I just don't want to do it. Right. But I find opportunities to love which are small and rather secret and unnoticed. 
Then I had to do some big things. Uh, I know I want Ginny to come home and say, you did the floors. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I, I just, I have, I have great delight. And I said, you know, you ought to stay away more often. I get a lot done here. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, let's go on. Let's, let's talk about Galatians. Uh, D. Okay, Galatians chapter 3, 11. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law. For the righteous shall, shall live by faith. And there he's quoting Habakkuk 2, verse 4. And he quotes Habakkuk 2, verse 4 in the book of Romans, too, in the letter to the Romans. So this is, uh, this is like Paul is prefiguring the Reformation when Luther picked up this and ran with it. He ran all over Germany with it. And, <laughs> and you know what happened? The righteous shall live by faith. You want to say it, you put three underlines under by faith. <laughs> I love it. I just love it. The righteous shall live by faith. Uh, back to Evelyn, please. Okay, number 20, uh, 324. So then the Lord was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Oh, now see how he joins baptism to mm -hmm. our means of coming into that <clears throat> grace in which we stand and through which we are saved. Mm-hmm. These are just a few quotes out of the six chapters that I hope will whet your appetite to read the entire letter. Chapter four, where did we leave off? I can do that. Galatians chapter four. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. Does this remind you of Christmas? <laughs> yes. It sure does. God sent his son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. That's John 3.17. We ought to put up John 3.17 alongside of 3.16. Well, that's another story. Uh, back to Evelyn. For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Well, we talked about that earlier, didn't we? Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Don't use your freedom as an opportunity to sin. I don't think you would do that, not knowingly. There's a conscience. There is the memory of God's law and the love that you have for people will lead you not to sin against your neighbor, whoever that is. Um, I want to put a comment in here. Uh, certainly. About love for your neighbor, I think begins, and, and I, I don't mean to say this wrongly, love for yourself. And I think there's so many self-loathing people that it psychology needs to get to them to not feel you know along with you know religion in the sense but the self-loathing I, I think that's also prevalent and they don't even know why and haven't got faith enough to 
get over it, but it does time sometimes. Yes. I, I don't know why either, but I would say to that person, I want to tell you how very, very much God loves you. Yes. Right, to, right. Uh, to hate yourself is to believe that God is wrong when he says, I love you. <laughs> when a child says, you don't love me anymore to the parent, the parent tries in any way possible to show how who, who put shoes on your feet and clothes on your back. <laughs> oh, you did. I'm talking about a four-year-old or a five-year-old. Mm -hmm. Well, you spend a lot of time helping the, your neighbor's kids. And what about me? Um, mm -hmm. and, and that's that's jealousy. Uh, Maybe it's a beginning to have self-loathing because there's something there uh, that's telling you, well, maybe I did something wrong, you know, so it could be. Oh, yes, certainly. There, there can be something in your memory and it keeps bothering your conscience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, then you're not going to be able to love your neighbor very much if you don't love yourself. I, that's your point, isn't it? Okay. We're almost out of time, and I can't do all of the quotes uh, today, as I think we started around uh, one hour ago. I, I really hope you have enjoyed this little taste and just a little dip into Paul's letter to the Galatians. It is such a valuable letter, as Luther points out, in everything that he does in the Reformation can be found in this letter and some of the passages in Romans. Yeah. And it's, uh, it sums up almost his entire theology. Mm -hmm. Our fight today is the same fight against legalism and antinomianism and against anyone who would say that uh, I, I don't need a, a savior it's all here and um, when these issues come up you and i need to know the truth of this part of the bible and that's why we're here together let us pray oh father hear our prayer on the basis of not not on the basis of our works but on the basis of christ's completed work for us you sent your son to die for my sins, not just for the sins of the whole world, for, but for my personal sins and for all those who are listening and watching this video. Lord, transform us by your spirit that we walk by the spirit and not by flesh. And when we find a, a neighbor or friend bearing a burden, we come and bear that burden with them and for them. And when we find anyone having sinned against us, we readily forgive as we've been forgiven. We have a lot to learn, Lord, and we stumble and we fail every day. But for forgiveness, we depend on your grace through Christ Jesus, your son, who loved himself, who loved us and gave himself for us in his name we make this prayer and god's people always say it's true by saying amen amen, amen.